We're dealing with a topic which is very broad-based. And this affects all of us, individuals, companies, societies, the international community, when we think even further, cyberspace. It's an issue which uh, is in process. So, in a sense, one can say a lot of things without being held responsible because it's mainly in the future. Um, some people look at digital transformation as the fourth industrial revolution. And when we think about the disruption in many industries which is coming, there may be a good point to do so. On the other hand, one can also look at this as just a further development of what we saw, saw coming in when the computers were used in the 60s and 70s and then developed further. And one of the reasons why may, one may argue that way, that it's just a continuation, is that with all the talk about digital transformation, we haven't seen much productivity growth, which then is needed to have economic growth. So that's an open question. We have, as you may have seen from the program, a large number of experts. And uh, we have only, I should say, two hours. So that will require some discipline, and that's perhaps the reason why I was asked to stand in front of you, because I have some German blood in me. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, among the nine people on stage here, uh, five nationalities. They come from the world of politics, from the world of business, and from academia. And they have all a lot to say. So we have imposed some strict rules on them. We will start with two very well-known speakers who will deliver some broad overview. And I would like to call on the minister Capriunica as the very first to say where Slovenia is in this world of digital transformation and what the plans are for the future. Most of you know the minister very well. I looked at his CV and uh, I thought um, this is certainly a man with a vision. He studied in Maribor. Uh, organizational science and information systems. When you think about these are terms which we don't use anymore. But 20 years ago, that was very much in light of seeing the digital transformation coming, because we're not only talking about technical issues, but we are also talking about the effect on society. He has spent his life in public uh, service, and public administration, and he's a great believer, I picked this up, in the implementation of bold digital solutions for better public service, something we all like to see, and to build a more inclusive society. Could I ask the minister to take over? Dear distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, if I may say so, uh, I'm glad that I can welcome you here in Bled also in the name of Slovenian government, discussing the topic, as you said before, which was in, in the beginning computers, then it became an organizational problem, and what's now, now it's a social problem. It's not even technical problem. And this is what, by my strong believing, is the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution that we are facing. It's not that we are creating technology. It's there. Now the question is what to do with the technology, because the possibilities that this technology brings really shifts everything, how we work and how we live. So this is the revolution. It's not technology. It's how to use it, how to implement it. I'm very, I very re uh, like to use analogies. And I say, for example, when electricity became available, that we all can use it, it shifted everything what we did. 
And uh, one of the problems that uh, we are facing with the digital transformation is uh, safety of the data. And we say, well, can we exchange all the data all over the world? You said you are in my territory. No, we are in one space. There's no, no, there's no borders anymore. But when it comes to the safety, it's also, you know that electricity can kill you instantly. But we use it with safety precautions. So with data, it's also dangerous to share the data. But with safety precautions, we can use it, we can share it, and then we build new business models and new uh, development that we are looking at. But when it comes to the politics, to the state, in the digital transformation, for me it's extremely important that we understand all together that science, uh, business, governments are not different worlds who want to little, communicate a little bit and support or not support to each other, but living separate lives. We are becoming one connected ecosystem. And if we want to succeed, this really has to be one ecosystem. It's not that sometimes we have meetings and we cooperate with and exchange ideas. We have to live these ideas together. And this is what we are trying to do in Slovenia in the green reference country in digital Europe, as we call this initiative. That means that we are focused to preserve what's nice in life, in the environment, and digital technologies are very fine to do that. And we would like to be digital, but digital only in the way that improve the quality of the life of our citizens and improve the possibilities of our business. These are only two goals that every politician should have, to improve the business opportunities for our companies and improve the quality of life. And this is what we are focusing when we are applying the technologies. And when we are talking about the reference, we would like to be the country who is not inventing new possibilities because there is so much possibilities already existing that for me only question is how to apply them to everyday use and everyday life on the system level. This is our focus. And when it comes to applying these possibilities of changes, big data, and new social media, new systems, and so on. It's always the question, yes, but when the uh, framework of the leg leg legal framework will change, when the people heads will change, then we can apply this system. But for us, reference project is also that. We have to fight to the bureaucrats, we have to change the legal framework, we have to change how we think, and this is part of the implementation. And if we are success successful in that, all this, how we change the legislation, how we fight the bureaucrats, how we change the way how we think, this will be the reference model. And this model we are trying to spread from the governmental initiative to the very strong everyday cooperation with our businesses. Yesterday we started initiative, we call it Smart Region in the Western Balkan region. So we are organically growing and spreading these ideas and only what good, what's good will survive. What's not good will die and that's okay. That's organic. What people like, they will use. What people don't like, they will not use. But if people like something and if people have benefits from digital transformation, then the role of the government is to make it possible and to bring choices. Not to select in the name of the people, but to bring choices and let people to select what they really use and they really, how can they really improve the quality of their life in everyday sense. What's very important from the state for me is very simple, or what we can give that these opportunities can grow are two things, open data and open communication. This is the role of the state. What to do with the data, how to communicate, what kind of uh, new services, business models, business types of organizations will grow on that basis. Let live to, to business, to everyday life inventions, and let, let live to people to select what they like. If people like to change the way of their mobility, they will use it. If they don't, 
they will not use it. But the role of the state is that we make possible that new business models and new uh, services are really there for everyday usage and to quality and to improve the quality of life. And the big data, it's not important only because this is the oil of the future, as we like to say. It's important because we learned to collect the big data, which is not structured. That's a big problem. We are still, when I went to the School of Informatics, you know what was the data? The, the register, the database, well structured, forget it. Now it's, we're lost in space. With the data, we, we know, know how to collect it. We know very well already how to analyze big data, how to get for, to interesting information from that. What we don't know yet, and this is what we would like to do, is to connect big data directly to run or to improve the public systems. Then we have the guiding mechanism. Then the, the circle will be closed. This is in the field of the data. In the field of the communication, what we would like to do, we say communication always in the communicational sandwich. Optics everywhere and wireless network accessible everywhere. So if you make a sandwich, as I said yesterday, you bring a bread, communication in the ground, in the sky, open data, then different kinds of uh, foods will be created. But you have to have these ingredients. And this is what we are trying to do, to open communication, to open data. We changed the legislation in the data field. We already open this data very much, public data. And uh, my final goal, if I may uh, share my vision, is that all data that's not conflicting the personal interest and the data that's not threatening the business interest should be public. Why not? If I share my data, I can get the data from others. And my business model, my services will be much, much better because I can build them on something, not on guessing. And also we like to say, as Mr. Deming said, the man without the data is just another man with an opinion. We like to say that the country without the big data is just another country hoping for the best. Big data is something that we can use to prevent bad things to happen because we can predict. And if we open big data, we can be healthier, we, we can have less social problems, we can have better traffic, we can have better communication, agriculture, education. If we open data, use it and predict it, then our use of resources that we have is much smarter. Just imagine, for example, what's completely possible, that we would all share our data through biomedicine uh, um, systems and models that we have. We can reduce the number of strokes, for example, at least for half. No problem, because you can indi indicate stroke when it will happen before, and it's very easy to prevent it by half. If we would all wearing smartwatches, sharing the blood uh, structure with my doctor, with intelligent system that knows, hops, you are going in the area when there is a serious dan danger that in next days or hours you will be hit by a stroke. And if we cut it by half, because everyone is wearing this, every doctor is following this, because it's in, in my medical system implemented, financed, educated, we use this. This is huge. This huge amount of money that we can save, and it's not the question about the money. The quality of life is better. People will be healthier. If we predict what will happen with my job, because we follow what's happening with the industry, with the climate, uh, with the mobility of the people, and we predict what will happen, I know two, three years in advance that I will be out of the job. So I can start now education and re-education for different job, and I will not be a social problem in, in three years because I reacted preventively. This is what big data can do if it's used smart, connected, and if it is a public good. Communication and the data in the digital transformation in a smart country should be public good just like roads or water or whatever we use. This is what we are aiming. This is what we try to do, try to have partners 
with the science industry, other governments to really build an ecosystem for better life. And Slovenia is the country just the right size to be a sandbox, if you would like, to experiment, but not to play with our citizens. Just to have smart, sensible experiments, we will use what's good and we will be open to others to learn from us and we are always open to learn from others and this is the way that you can build new quality in the communication, in the open communication and this is the only way that we bring something new to our citizens. Thank you, this was my, just my explanation what we are trying to do and what kind of a country we would like to build and what kind of a cooperation we are inviting you to be part of. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, for this very upbeat uh, introduction into the digital transformation of Slovenia and the world. Um, may I now call on Dr. Anil Minon, um, a man who's spent a lot of time in the digital world when we didn't call it the digital world. He is the president of Smart and Connected Communities of Cisco, one of the largest companies in this field, in the world. He is a man of the world, has lived in various places around the world. He has been with IBM and had made a great career there and um, has even started in the world of academia as a faculty member uh, in marketing in Emory University. He remains connected with the community and also with the academic world. Dr. Minon, may I call on you? Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to try it one more time. Good morning. That's better. It's a beautiful day out there. You should all be excited. Not to be inside, but at least you can look out and see it. So I have 15 minutes. What I'm going to do is uh, sort of build on Minister's uh, points, uh, but give you maybe a little different flavor that is a little bit more global and then coming into what does that mean for Slovenia and for this region? When I met with the uh, Prime Minister and with the Minister and the delegation in San Jose about seven months ago, we had discussed this. And, um, and uh, I think they said, would you come uh, to Slovenia for uh, this conference? And I said, I'm always happy to come to this part of the world. Uh, it is extraordinarily beautiful. This is my first time uh, to Slovenia, but um, I was in Croatia a few months ago. And I told my wife this morning, Croatia is a favorite place right now. I said, you've got to come to Slovenia now. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so this is where we are. Let me, let me, start, uh, let me start with um, why I find this extraordinarily exciting the space to be in. I come from a company that most of us probably don't know much about other than what we say we are the plumbers of the internet. <laughs> we are not the sexy ones like a Microsoft or a Google uh, or, or, or Apple but you know without us none of these things would happen. Uh, so we are the plumbers and about 80 percent of the world's internet goes through either a Cisco switch or a router and uh, so so we sometimes say uh, we are there we want to be more and more invisible, but we want to be more and more relevant. But I'll tell you why I am, I don't even talk about Nexus and routers and all the others. I want to tell you a little bit about why I think the world is going to be uh, very different and hopefully much better than where we are today. Um, and, and I want to put it in the context of what I don't call the smart cities, we call it smart connected communities. And there's a reason why we use that term. Um, in, in the context of the globe, and especially in this part of the region, where the cities are smaller, it's the region and the communities that matter. Let me start with the one that is one of my favorite achievements. Um, when we started this a few years ago, when we were looking at where is the world moving to, especially as it deals with digital world, uh, a country that fascinated me and, and my team, and Joe, you know this probably better than any other person in this room, probably, Tanzania, country of about 45 to 47 million people with the highest birth rate in Africa, maybe in the world, with the highest child infant mortality, 150,000 babies die just from heart condition. 
every year. In this country of 47 million, there's not one pediatric surgeon. There's not one pediatric cardiologist. There's not one pediatric pulmonologist. And there's not even one pediatric radiologist when we started. Not one in 47 million people. Now, when you look at that, what do you do about that? Because you can take that and take to multiple parts of Africa and Asia and, and, and other parts of the world, and therein lies the future of the world and the danger of the world in many ways. So there were two professors from Yale who said, we want to come back to India, radiologists. They came back and we set up a company with them and they set up an entire network connecting the primary physicians in Tanzania to pulmonologists, cardiologists, radiologists in Bangalore and they were treating the patients using telepresence. And we saved lives. Now what is interesting about this company that we started, we moved into Tibet, into Nepal, doing it in the inner, in the inner villages of India and elsewhere. This company also on the same platform runs 167 second tier hospitals in America. The valuation for the company is now over a billion dollars. So the whole idea is with that same platform where you're saving babies in Tanzania, you're able to create a new business model that transforms hospital care in second tier cities in Appalachian Mountains in America where they have no access to doctors and midwives and nurses. That's just one example. Let's take another example, which is a little less provocative, but just as interesting. Korea, 3% of Korean's GDP is spent on just tutoring for science and math, beyond school. $15 billion is spent on English, just English. The highest paid teacher is an English teacher at $3 million in Korea. 500,000 families, either the mother or the father, does not live in Korea at any given point because one of the child is in an English-speaking school somewhere outside of Korea. Now, in this context, what we did is there's a new city coming up called Songdo, which is for the higher income, but we connected every apartment with the telepresence units to schools and teachers and tutorials in America where there are lots of second-generation Koreans in colleges. Suddenly using video conferencing, you're transforming education delivery. I'll just give you one end to the other end. You have a small startup company in Tel Aviv using cloud and big data and running the water management systems of Singapore and Adelaide and in Israel. All of this coming back to the point that is saying that this is here and now, and we are beginning to see the change in the world. And I'm suggesting that there's a third wave of the digital economy that is coming up, which is larger than the first two waves. And it is in that third wave that a country like Slovenia or a Croatia or this region can be global players. The first wave was the globalizing of the IT services industry. Joe, if you and I go back, and we have gray hair, so we can go back to our time frame. And 30 years ago, if you went to an MNC, a multinational in Europe, and said, we're going to run your application management systems out of Bangalore, out of India, they would have thrown you out of the office and said, don't ever come back here. But today they do. 30 years ago, if you went to a large engineering company in Europe and said, we're going to run some of your big research institutes and sections out of India or out of Mexico or somewhere else, they would have thrown you out of the office. But today, they are. So I am suggesting the third wave, which is larger, is the growth of a global urban services industry. Cities will not be managed by the city administration within the city boundaries, within the city budgets. There is no reason why a city needs to have its lights and its water systems and its traffic management systems monitored and managed in that city, within that budget, within that people, increasing traffic, increasing the population, when you could move those services into smaller cities, into other parts parts of the region, manage it on an integrated platform at a lower cost. I would argue that the next multi-billion dollar businesses are going to be in the urban services area. It's already happening because I am working with a company that's already $800 million and all they do is they monitor the stores in America and Europe for pilferages. 
companies like Dunkin' Donuts and uh, KFC and the others, they lose over two to three billion dollars on pilferage. People just taking stuff away that are employees. They have the cameras, they have the video, but they don't have anybody monitoring it. Those are people sitting in villages now monitoring those, and they're actually taking 30 percent of all the savings. Because there's an interesting fact, villagers have an extraordinary quick ability to monitor and scan things. Even if they can't read, they can tell you what's going out of space. <laughs> so Bangladesh is becoming one of the big areas for monitoring video surveillances for stores. This is the world, and this is, this is an $800 million business right now. One million patients in ICU in America are monitored for their vitals. One million patients in ICU are monitored in Chennai, the old Madras in India. So my point is there's this new industry coming. Let us rethink that. So in this context, what are the three things that we have been focused on in smart connected communities? There are three transitions taking place in the worldwide, and this is uniform. And the first one is what do we in this part of the region, you're facing on a daily basis with the refugee crisis. And I told the PM and I told the deputy PM, refugee crisis is here for a long time. It has nothing to do with Syria. It has everything to do with Syria. You will be living with that for a long period of time. And so that means you have to rethink it. Why is that? When you think about Europe, when you take Germany, for example, which is going to be by in 20 years, over 40% of Germans will be over the age of 65, and Germany will be 15% smaller in size. Japan is already getting to a point where always 40% are over the age of 65, and they're shrinking by 20%. Same story in Russia, same story in Italy. Then you look at Saudi Arabia, which is going to be up 150% in the next 20 years. You look at India, which is 1.2 million, with a median age of under 27. In 2050, will be 1.6 billion people with a median age of 23 and below. Now, on one hand, you can call this the demographic dividend for a country like India, but 60% of those kids don't have access to healthcare, jobs, and education. There's nothing more dangerous than a country like India with 60% of kids who are sitting there with access to the internet before they have access to good, clean water and healthcare. <coughs> This is uniform. So today what is happening is 10,000 people are leaving rural areas and going into a city every hour. 10,000 people are leaving every hour to go from rural areas into cities. This translates to the creation of one London every month for the next 36 years just to keep up with urbanization of this world. We have to create one London, a city of one London, one month, every month for the next 36 years just to keep up. So in many ways it's already happening. You go into London and you go into East London and that is not the same as West London. You get on train from Westchester, I mean Westminster all the way to Stratford and the life expectancy drops by about 10 years. That is the difference between a developed world and a developing world. You go into Paris, same story. You go to the Netherlands, you go into Rotterdam, and Rotterdam has got a very different profile than Amsterdam. So this challenge is all over, so we've got to figure out what do we do with this entire urbanization. Second one is the economic growth. By 2050, over 50% of the top 10 GDP countries, GDP will be two countries, India and China. Of the top 10 GDP per cap, uh, GDP countries, only two will be European, UK and Germany. The rest are Brazil, Russia, India, Indonesia. So which means if you want to be a global company for the next 50, 100 years, you better be relevant in Indonesia. You better be relevant in India. You better be relevant in Mexico. You better be relevant in Brazil. Because otherwise, you are going to get smaller and smaller and be very relevant in a rich country. So if that is the case, these countries are going to be rich in absolute terms and poor on a per capita basis for the next 100 years. How are you going to deliver urban services at an affordable price to India, Mexico, Brazil, and other places? That is the next business model. That is where cloud computing and different scale models become critical. And the last one which we are particularly most excited about and qualified to talk about than the first two, B being the technology companies in Cisco, which is that the internet is no longer the internet of five years ago. The internet of five years from now is the internet of a video internet. So while we talk about open data, we should be talking about open video. 
In 2012, 20 American families, average American families, don't ask me what an average American family is, <laughs> but an average American family loaded onto the internet in 2012, they're about the same amount of data as the entire global internet of 2008. By 2020, one family will load onto the internet the same amount of data as the entire global internet of 2008. The point is, it is all video-based. And the moment you have video with everything connected to everything, education will be different, healthcare will be different, jobs will be different, the way we live will be different. We have to plan for that world, not the world where we are and the way the world we were. So in that context, just as a very simple thing is, everything we do in our head, we always think in terms of space and time. I got to go somewhere. We say, I got to go to the doctor. I got to go to work. I got to go to school. We even say, I got to go Google. <laughs> and the question is, why do you need to go Google? Why can't Google come to you? And more importantly, why do you need to go to the doctor? If you are not sick and you go into hospital, you're likely to come back sick if you're an older person. <laughs> But especially for second tier. So the whole idea is if I have video, if I have immersive video, which is already there, which is a highly virtual reality, you can do a lot of things. In fact, our research shows that for 80% of a doctor's visit, even for a high specialty doctor's visit, the doctor himself or herself doesn't need to touch you. So I'm working with a, one of the world's number one oncologists for prostate cancer in Miami. So he and I have been talking for the last three years, and now we've got a $3 million contract from, from the military government, military in, in America, which is, we said, I said, you go all these places, you go and you treat the prince in Saudi Arabia for prostate. I said, do you touch the guy when you're you know, doing surgery? He says, no, I'm on my computer. I said, do you need to sit next to him? No, I'm sitting actually in a room outside. Do you need to be in the room outside? Can you be in a different building in the same zone? Yeah. Can you be in a different city? Yeah. Can you be in a different country? Sure, as long as I have no late latency. So that's what we're testing because what is happening is tomorrow's wars are not the traditional wars. It's going to be these little incidents and by the time you take a soldier or a civilian to the hospital and take the time to airlift them, it's too late. So we are saying how can you do field surgery with the doctor sitting elsewhere and monitoring, managing and doing surgeries. So we're already testing that. We're already deploying that. This is the world we're moving into, and in this context, we say, how do we get there? So, but uh, you know, what the May, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister was talking about, this is what I'm hearing. I just came from Dubai. It seems like with a different accent, I'm hearing the same thing. I was in Copenhagen, same thing, different accent. I was in Berlin, same thing, different accent. Was in Coimbatore, same thing, different accent. I'm flying from here to Pondicherry, which is a former French colony of India, to meet with the French ambassador and the governor of Pondicherry to make Pondicherry a smart city for France. So the whole idea is who is going to win this race to become the digital country and the digital world. And I would argue that there are five things that we have noticed, what we have studied, what I've come down to. The first one, which is crit critically important, is political leadership, vision, and political will. But it's not about saying what is a city. I always said that if smart city is the answer, what is the question? If technology is the answer, what is the question? And I've said, and I'm, I'm sure my colleagues who are from technology field will agree with me, the last thing you want to do is ask a technologist on how you create your smart city. It's too important to be left to us. We are there to enable, to provide different options, to create new options, to come up with different ways that you can accomplish the thing. So the first question to ask on smart cities and smart countries is that we say, what is the soul of your city? I always ask, what is the soul of your city that's going to endure through troubled times? Tell me the soul and I will tell you the future. And if you are not managing and maintaining the soul through the discussion of smart cities and smart country, you're losing the plot. There are many cities that I've gone to that are very pretty, but somehow you don't feel like there's a vibrancy. I go to Mexico City, I love it. It may be difficult, but it's got a soul. I go to Bombay, it's got a soul. I go to these places and I'm saying, I love coming here because people have vibrancy. It's that vibrancy that you keep and then you build around it to offer better services and better business facilities. So first one is political will. 
And in that context, what I would suggest is there are many of these verticals that are not yet defined in water management, energy management, traffic management. These are 30, for traffic management globally is a $40 billion business. If you could get 20% of that business globally out of Slovenia, that's a big business. Lighting, managing the lights globally is a 50 to $60 billion business. And it can be run globally from a region. So I would say pick an area and saying we're going to become the world's domain expert in this. And then comes the second one, is the whole idea of global standards. Unless we are thinking globally, regardless of whether we circumscribe it to a smaller city, we are not going to create scale. Software technology requires scale. The third one, which is a big area where the government plays a big role and increasingly should play a bigger role, is smarter regulations. Most cities are run with regulations for the mechanical world, not even for the electrical world, and definitely not for the digital world. For example, the signs like that sign over there. You see all those signs that run here, run there? There's no reason for those signs. Maybe 30 years ago, yes. Even 30 years ago, most of us are smart. Say, That's the door. You run into the door. You don't run into a wall. <laughs> But you put that sign up, which costs money, and yet today you won't get a permit if you don't put a sign up there, even though we have digital phones that say, the fire is on the ground floor, you please stay, all of you, on the first floor. Yet we have rules and policies for traffic management. In one of the cities in, in, in France, we actually have cameras that gives you parking per tickets, but yet then that message has to go to a police officer who walks up and writes the ticket. Why? Because the union said that's the way it should be. <laughs> so we need to bring in the labor unions along with technologists and all the civic organizations, S smart regulation. The last two are the ones I'm going to pause at, um, and then, and then and that I'm sure my, my colleagues who are going to come up after this will speak more to that. But the third, fourth, first three are hard, fourth and the fifth are probably more difficult. <laughs> and that's why smart cities are so challenging. Fourth is public-private partnerships. There is not a single company in the world that I know of, not a single country in the world that I know of, not a single city that I know of, or a community that I know of, which will create a smart city, smart country on their own. The governments can do it, and the private enterprise cannot do it on their own. It has to be true public-private partnership, not what we today call public-private partnership, where governments are trying to avoid paying the cost, and, gov and private are trying to avoid taking any risk. It has to be something different and substantial. And the last one, which I'm going to end, is local ecosystem. This cannot be done by global companies. You need a local engine of innovation because the local entrepreneurs and the local people know their cities and their region better than somebody like me who will fly and fly out and suddenly I'm an expert. But in order to do that, you need to have the capacity of engineering, the capacity of business thinking, the capacity of entrepreneurialism, the capacity for experimentation, the capacity for accepting mistakes, and the capacity for investing behind these. And the local ecosystem is where I think larger companies are obviously looking for startups, investing, partnering. So with these five things, I think we can create a smart region, a smart city, a smart country, or a smart community. So those are some of the thoughts that I thought might be good ways to set it up. But I will tell you this, that this is an extraordinarily exciting time. And every day when I go in and I see, I just came back chairing a session, and I'm just going to use again the country that I was living in until about a few months ago, which is India. Uh, India has got some horrible, horrible problems problems and some horrible and some extraordinary opportunities. But when you consider the world's, 60% of the world's open defecators are in India. And you're talking about smart cities. I hate the job of the politician. You're trying to solve for an 18th century problem and also trying to prepare for the 21st century. There's just no way to do this. But I went into a village, into the inner villages, and there is an institution called uh, Augustia that trains kids who are family probably never even wrote a sentence in their entire history and started training them in science and math. Of the 50 top science winners of the Intel science context in India, 12 came from villages of that kind. So the capacity is there in all parts of the world. 
the capacity for innovation and business innovation is where we need. And this is where I think partnerships such as this, working and listening to all of you is the great and the most exciting thing. So thank you again for inviting me here. This has been, um, this is always one of the highlights. I travel 20 days a month. I travel uh, three to four countries a month for the last five years. So uh, my wife always wonders, are you still married to me or are you like? Uh, but the thing is, what keeps me going is everywhere I go, the future is on one hand hand very stark on the other hand if you do some things together I think we can actually solve for a lot of the problems and solve for a lot of the challenges that we have so thank you again I look forward to meeting several of you in private but I think did I go over my 15 minutes very well done thank you <laughs> and in that, um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes here because one of the things that we were, when we met with the Prime Minister and with the uh, with Minister Kapernikar um, in December, right? We met in December. We said this whole thing about urban services and we said we need a different way of thinking for governments. And I, I have to tell you, the, the government in Slovenia and the ministry here said, yep, we're going to do something. They started working with us and um, I have this written down to make sure I don't miss, my, my team gave me this. So I'm going to say they, the Ministry for Public Administration, working under Minister uh, of Public Administration, Boris Koprinovka, uh, led by Jurg, um, in five months, in five months, got themselves certified as a Cisco Cloud and Managed Service Program, which is uh, for only for public sector. Now, what is interesting, exciting about this, it's about connectivity, offering it as a service, connectivity, wireless, but more importantly, big data. It is the only public administration in the world to have gone through the certification. It's mostly SPs that have done that. Service providers like Slovenia Telecom or Deutsche Telekom. This is the first public administration, and it is the first, any first entity in Europe to offer this big data as a service for Cisco and to be certified. So it's an extremely, and this has been audited, so this is not like us kissing up to you, um, but you know, <laughs> this has been audited by external agency just like we audited uh, Deutsche Telekom and the others. So in that context, I was asked to give you, uh, Minister, a small token and recognition of your certification. So this is what we would have given you, but I come down. Just to say that I'm really glad to get this as a first government who really not only talking about being a service, but really certified as a service provider. And this is what we are trying to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Menon, for this inspiring uh, talk. And then handing over this present to the minister for his ministry. My thinking was, when I summarize what you said, was um, first of all, the plumbing itself is not so difficult, right? <laughs> but implementing it on a political side, that must be quite a task. And therefore, you just handed it over, right? So that's a very elegant uh, way to get out of this. Thanks very much for these two inspiring contributions. We'll just change the scene, as you can see. Uh, could I ask the panelists to move forward? You can, if you have good eyes, you can <laughs> discover where you sit. Please take a seat. Thank you. Yes. So as I said, we had to have a heavy panel here in front of us. Lots of things to say. Each of them could speak for 80 minutes minimum. But we have uh, made a deal here that nobody is allowed to speak longer than four and a half minutes. In fact, I have asked for a clock so everybody can see who is overdoing this, <laughs> and uh, it's a bit odd. This definitely is an analog watch, <laughs> and not uh, a digital um, asset. Um, I would, what we will do is we will just go through the panel and ask them a few questions about their area of expertise, 
and then we will try to get as much as possible into a discussion between the panelists and then we'll invite the forum to ask much more difficult questions. I would like to start with the chairman of Electro Maribor, Mr. Slovic, who um, has an extraordinary career when we just met, I said, when I look at your CV, you must be at least 100 years old. I think this is not very polite, but um, looking at this, he started um, in Maribor with a Master of Science in Electrotechnics. He uh, joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was an ambassador. He has made a career in the military. He has also been the mayor of Maribor. What else? Now he is the chairman of a large Slovene company. What else do you want to do in your life? Now, I wanted to start with Mr. Uh, uh, Sovic because he comes from an industry of electricity generation and distribution, etc. That is not an industry which comes to our mind when we talk about digital transformation. So, if I could ask you, what's happening in your industry? Are you doing anything? Thank you for your question. Uh, but uh, first of all, let me answer to the to, to first question that you mentioned in between. What is my life goal? My life goal is to win 100 meter race at age of 100. <laughs> so, um, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, what are we doing in energy business? Um, I think the impression might be that uh, energy business is not that much involved in digital transformation as perhaps some other sectors. But as very often in uh, our lives, impression can be wrong. Basically, energy sector is one of the, I would say, forerunner of the digital transformation. Uh, all the biggest utilities that we have in Slovenia in the field of energy, I mean electricity, uh, they have programs for digital transformation, but not only programs, they are already fulfilling it. So it's di digital transformation in electric electricity sector is real. It is happening right now. <laughs> Basically, we have here some partners that we are dealing uh, with. Uh, at the moment in Slovenia, we have almost 40% uh, of our uh, consumers that are already connected with smart meters, uh, with uh, advanced metering infrastructure, and all the services that are connected with that. Uh, and this goes on, and I believe in five, six years, we will have 100% coverage. At the moment, we already have like 80% coverage of energy that is distributed in our system with smart meters. Uh, I think the di digital transformation in our sector is basically the only answer how can we achieve uh, strategic climate goals that we have to face with. Uh, like the carbonization of mobility, the, carbo the, the carbonization of heating, cooling, uh, localization of energy production. All these issues can be dealt only with smart grids, uh, with new services that we can provide with smart grids. Not only smart grids, we are all already working on, on uh, strong, robust uh, grids because of climate change that we are all facing. Uh, perhaps foreigners, our guests from abroad, do not know that in year for, uh, 2014 we had sort of very strong catastrophe uh, connected with the weather that, that basically put the whole country for one week almost without electricity. So, we must work toward smart uh, grids, but also ro robust grid that will be able to resist to all these challenges. So I think the process is very strong. Uh, this goes on. But this opens some questions. We have now elements for smart grids, uh, but smart grids need smart tariffs. Without that, <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, hardware without software. Um, and this requires a smart approach from the side of regulation, which we hope uh, we, will, we will have in, able, uh, in order to be able to, to, to use all the potential, potentials that this uh, new technology brings and that we will be able to uh, 
sort of create new values for our customers, higher customer experience, and of course, new services. But this also opens some issues, some questions, like, uh, like uh, off-grid applications. Uh, today, if you will have energy discussion, I think today, later on, there are some. A lot of people are, think, are talking about off-grid. Some people believe that basically tomorrow we don't need grid anymore. And theoretically, it is true. Of course, we know that theory is something and practice is always slightly different. But uh, even if this would be the case, even if we would have majority of applications off-grid, then question still remains, who will pay for the rest? Who will pay for the people who will not be able to afford themselves to run off-grid applications, to, to install what is off-grid, to install uh, solar power or hydropower or whatever, and to be for yourself, and who cares for the neighbors? Né? So this is basically off-grid idea. Theoretically, it is very good, but practically, it needs uh, some questions to be solved. I don't believe that this will happen. I believe that we will still have networks tomorrow. I believe that we will have stronger share of off-grid applications, but still also in uh, off-grid uh, uh, landscape, people will need grid. In, in the mid of the winter, where there is not so many sun, and not, not that much sun shining in the, in the situation where there is frozen water, uh, you, you don't have enough uh, water, electri uh, electri hydroelectricity, then of course you need grid. So I think uh, although uh, off-grid applications can bring us to sort of atomization uh, of, of uh, electricity supply, I think that tomorrow we will still have grids, we will have, uh, still have connected uh, people, but we will have much larger share of renewables. And this can only be achieved with smart uh, grids, with smart tariffs, and smart policies that will support this for the benefit of all, not only for few. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Brunner, you are in a somewhat similar industry. Perhaps you're just coming after electricity generation. You come from Switzerland, you have an engineering degree, you have an MBA degree, you work for ABA, ABB, so electricity runs in your veins, <laughs> right? So you meter what's going on. Yes. So uh, where do you see the digital world coming into your industry, or is it already there? Have That's you arrived? <laughs> well, we are at the starting point of this. When, when you see uh, Mr. Menon made a lot of good points about how the future will look like and how interconnected we all are and the big data flows, etc. And to make all those things happen, we need energy. We need electricity, and everybody takes electricity for granted. Nobody thinks about where it's coming from, how it's produced, how it's distributed. To make those dreams, those visions come true about a smart, smart world, smart cities, interconnected cities, we need to have what I call an internet of energy. And thinking about the internet of energy, we are the plumbers of the internet of energy. We provide the smart knots which is called digital meters, which we are starting at the moment to deploy the first, I would say, the first generation of digital meters here in, in Europe and part of Middle East. It's at the beginning, but we still don't see the complete uh, wave coming. What are you doing with those data? Because Producing the data, so we said before, having big data is one thing. What are you using these data for? We have those, those uh, smart meters, digital meters, which is the crucial sensor at the end point of all distribution network into the home. We see that if you look in, I would say, 10 years forward, you will see that a lot of people, as Mr. Sovich just said, will have their own power generation at home. They will have solar roofs, they will have wind energy. We will have electromobility. So we will stress our network, our distribution network, which has been built up the last 100, 150 years, built up for a central power generation, distributing the energy to the end point. Now suddenly we will misuse this energy network and put everywhere power in. We, we put power in, we store power, we take power out. As I said, people would like to be autonomous.
but in the case the sun is not shining, the wind is not turning, and the batteries are empty, they will suck the energy back from the network. So then this off connected people will become connected again. And to measure all those data and, and do a predictable power uh, production, power distribution, you need to have a digital sensor which is called digital meter. This digital meter enabled today with the new, with the new communication possibilities we have nowadays, we have a two-way communication. One way giving all information back to the grid owner, to the power producer, the power distribution company, all information about what is the usage, what is the time of usage, what is the power quality at the end point of their network, if there is power, because today still 90% of the utilities don't know if you or I or we don't have power at home. They only know it if you pick up the phone and you call them and say, them, I have no power, what happens? With, with the new smart meter, with the new smart grid, with the digital grid, they will see this. They will act before you pick up the phone. So it's one thing that they get all kind of information and can forecast the power. They can take weather conditions in, into the equation to see, okay, if you produce your own solar power, we will have uh, overcast today, so they need, we need to deliver more power. They need to see the power quality. And on the other <coughs> side, we enable the consumer itself with another set of data to manage his own home. When he using the energy, how he's using the energy, when is he storing things, when he uses his cars, etc., and make those whole thing automated. Because all those nice dreams, ideas, visions won't come through if each of us has to think about and say, okay, now I have to switch on this and switch off this. It has to be automated. That comes with the new digital, not with the digital meter comes the 3G, the 3C for the customers. The choice, the convenience, and the comfort. If those things work out, then the things will go happen. And then we can power up all those smart cities, smart regions, mm -hmm. smart visions which we all have. I think we're very eager to see those things moving in the future. We have a lot of great plans. And we are just at the verge of starting those things. And I think we will, this will be a marathon as the network has been built over the, next, the last 150 years. We will see in the next 10 to 15 years huge changes to support, to enable what we call smart world. Thank you. Thanks very much. Are you at this very moment just in the hardware? And are you moving towards the software to we are, provide services to customers? We have complete solutions. Means we have we have the not digital not which measures. We have the communication parts as well as the what we call meter data management system, where you can collect all the data. You manage you manage all the network and you deliver the data into different systems for the utilities, for the producers, as well back to the consumers. So it's a complete solution. Yeah. Thanks very much. Let me then move to a very different industry, to Generali and Mr. Giovanni Sirina. You are sort of representing an industry which is sitting on huge IT systems, right? Like all big corporations in the financial space, you have also, and that may be slightly different from the banks, Lots of people running around selling insurance policy. It's said that at least 75% of those people who are now selling this will be out of job soon. Do you see this as well? Or is this very different in generality? You come from Trieste, you have an international career, you've moved around in various positions. You're now in Prague as the head of Generali in Central and Eastern Europe. So big job, most probably b lots of people. Will they be there in five years? The answer just straight is uh, mostly so. But uh, you're right uh, to point out that uh, let's say the industry is not the prototype uh, of uh, sexy or uh, digital champion. Uh, I think there are 
four uh, and then a fifth I would uh, add at the end uh, four uh, major disruptive uh, fi uh, fields the first one, and we have always have to start uh, from the client. I mean, the minister said that if they want you and if you have a, a reason to be there, you will survive. If you don't have a reason to be there, in the end, you will fail. Uh, I think uh, definitely the industry itself has and will play an even stronger role uh, in protecting and improving people's lives. What uh, is uh, changing completely, and it's not something we see, but everybody else sees, is client is changing, the client is not uh, happy enough to be serviced now and again. He wants to be able to reach you 24-7. Uh, that is, the, for us, uh, a huge difference if you consider that uh, the vast majority of talking retail, not corporate clients, retail clients have one to two contacts per year. Forget 24 hours uh, a day, per year with the company. So this is the big paradigm change, to be able to service and want to service uh, continuously. The client is more and more uh, informed. There is uh, more and more transparency, then the clients want more and more transparency. Sometimes regulation goes in one sense on paper, but in the end we have less and less transparency, but this is a, is a different uh, type of fish. So, client, we have to adjust to our client, definitely. And uh, the second uh, issue, and there I come to, is how. Some uh, vision, say you don't need what you all need the people for. You have a nice uh, call center, website, uh, video support, and uh, and that's that's it. We have uh, been uh, doing a lot of research on very young people, so age of my children were teenagers, to find out do they really want that? Is really only the pure digital world what they what, what clients want? And in the end, uh, the answer is quite uh, astonishing. I must say, I was uh, surprised uh, myself. Is yes, for the small stuff, they don't want to be bothered, especially not be bothered by somebody the age of their parents. So they want to have uh, access when they want to, how they want to. But stress, uh, strangely enough, even the youngest say, for important things, I want a guy person, a physical person, I can meet in person, be it, uh, of course, not to, to have a travel insurance or probably motor insurance is not the most complex co uh, uh, product. But if I need, let's say, health protection, if I need a pension, if I need something which is really valuable to, to my well-being, then yes, I want to have all the information in advance and want to have comparison in advance, explanation, but then in the end, before I have the final decision, somebody must come. Of course, when I want, at the time I want, uh, where I want. But, so the, the human factor in uh, distribution, <coughs> kind of contact, will play a role. Certainly not as it is now. And also a very important uh, area where uh, we all have our experience with insurance is also in claims in claims for paper mm, delivery, for uh, pictures and that sort of stuff, the digital world is uh, more than sufficient. But if there is something big, mm -hmm. somebody to complain to, to discuss, to explain, to have something explained. Also because our business, apart from some lines, is not uh, the, let's say, uh, the easiest. We, there is an inherent complexity in our, co in our products that needs to be explain. Mm. And Mr. Serena, sorry that I cut in here. In the banking world, we have now online banks, which don't have an office anymore. You cannot go into a retail bank. Is there something similar coming in the insurance companies? We have in the fintech world lots of new enterprises which cut out the juicy bits and pieces. Like we all know, when we make an international transfer of money, it costs a fortune. Now, there are some companies who cut in just doing that. This is not a bank. This is just a transfer office. It has a long history. It's now new, very efficient, very cheap. 
but it's a very profitable business for the banks. So it hurts the banks quite considerably. Do you see something similar in any we, we have. We are, I think, the strongest in Europe on direct business. So we do have a, a very, very sizable experience in the field. We see a very slow growth of clients wanting uh, online, uh, pure online services. That market is in Europe more or less stable, very, very limited uh, growth. Where you see competition is within these direct clients switching from one direct provider to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the very clearly the, where the battle will be won will be at the combination of online services where the clients want them and uh, the, let's say, advisory part. Will you have the same number of people long-term? No. We'll have long-term, less, more qualified people with a very strong digital support in, for the customer's experience. This is what I see. The second point, and this is something which is absolutely fundamental, you mentioned uh, margins and efficiency. Uh, a, a very disruptive uh, impact will be on processes. Definitely, it will be much more automation in the system. The big, uh, let's say, uh, not showstopper, but let's say a factor working against a strong, quick transformation are the legacy systems, big old uh, systems. Uh, we are uh, developing, but I think most of the big competitors are working into making them much more agile and substituting them by uh, more modern, uh, uh, more modernly uh, laid out uh, approach. Th the issue is the old system start from behind the new ones and that where we are sub investing a lot must start from the client. So you have the client, the client interface, whichever channel he wants, you must be able to service him through different channels and go backwards. Uh, maybe two uh, further uh, aspects is uh, to improve clients' uh, perception of insurance or quality of our services, uh, first of all, switch from a pure product to a solution so you mm -hmm. don't need to sell or you will not sell in the future. Already now we don't have uh, pure insurance products. You have a, an assistant component, a component of something, uh, uh, especially in healthcare, of, of services, of uh, medical services on top of the pure, the pure uh, insurance. Uh, that is definitely solution driven rather than product driven. And big data and the available of, uh, of uh, uh, anal depth of analysis, the possibility no. to have deeper analysis. Because insurance companies are very well known for that. But, uh, but uh, that will we not be able to do on our own. For instance, we have uh, uh, invested in uh, specialized companies. We have a company that uh, uh, specializes on telematics sort of uh, these devices, be it on a smartphone in the car or a black box in mm -hmm. the car, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can analyze uh, the driving behavior. And then not only according to driving behavior pricing, which would be, let's say, the trivial, but also give a feedback to the client to improve his driving uh, habits. Oh. This is the next uh, frontier uh, on the so product. More side. services, more solutions rather Absolutely. than products and to make it to make the exit from the traditional industries or insurance companies more difficult? Look, the, we have a know-how and a risk carrying and risk sharing function which is unique to the industry. Mr. Sus uh, Mr. Pusa, you are the founder, CEO of a consultancy firm uh, which uh, has perhaps started with general management consultancy but now has found that digital transformation is an area where many companies need some support not only here in Slovenia but also in the region. You have yourself an international background so therefore your company is also internationally active. You have an MBA from Cornell, you have been in Germany studying but also here in Slovenia. Is this what we've just heard <coughs> somehow typical for a company, you mentioned the term legacy systems, right? We have everything and it works so well. 
Oops, I didn't say that it works so well. No, I'm pushing. <laughs> you are a very profitable company, right? One of the few in the financial industry in Italy. So you should be proud of that. It works very well. It must be very difficult to change. That's the point. Do you see that among your customers? Mm, yes. I think that actually the digital transformation for companies is actually becoming more or less a uh, race to adapt to reality. It's no longer adapting to a new reality or adapting to something that is coming in the future. Now, what that usually means or what we're seeing now is that there's, I think, no CEO of either a large enterprise or a small or medium company that isn't aware that um, it's not the amount of pain that's requiring change, it's more the fact that the pain is around the corner uh, if you don't change immediately. Uh, now, when talking about change, um, I think that what, what uh, resonates most uh, for our clients is the fact that um, it's no longer about upstream or downstream, uh, downstream opportunities. So it's no longer about uh, looking towards your suppliers or buyers where they should be looking. So uh, it's becoming more or less uh, something where you have to be more open to uh, what you have or what your, uh, let's call it, legacy systems and not talking about IT only, uh, allow you to think about. So. What that uh, brings in practice is the fact that, for example, we work for two clients uh, at the moment who are in the um, um, telco or and or media uh, business uh, from different countries, actually also different regions, who have exactly the same ideas. And these ideas seem uh, horribly disruptive to everyone in the company, but what I find interesting is that they are looking at the same opportunities in a very similar way, although uh, coming from very different backgrounds. So um, they both saw opportunities, uh, interestingly enough, in what Mr. Koprivnikar uh, used in his example first. So uh, how to improve the health of citizens and make a buck while doing it, uh, which also, uh, to come back to what was said before, I think uh, offers uh, one of the first steps towards creating um, what I think is the holy grail of digital transformation for the society as a whole, which is, as has been said before today, uh, the public-private partnership. Um, I was always deeply skeptical of uh, the idea being successful, but I think that um, digital world uh, with everything that comes uh, attached to it actually provides uh, two key components to uh, establishing successful and at the end of the day profitable for everyone at different levels, uh, public partnerships, these two components being on the one hand uh, the the pain that I mentioned, so the pain on one hand of uh, how to come up with something that is regarded by citizens as a meaningful improvement of their life for obviously the politics and the public administration. And on the other hand for businesses, how to protect uh, your top line or how to protect your investment in legacy systems that you built up over uh, a long time. And now you have to reap the rewards in a world where uh, most of our clients at least live in uh, what uh, was called before the shrinking uh, developed world. So uh, with the companies looking at their primary markets, I think that uh, these opportunities are key in their further development. And as such, obviously, this also has uh, brought about change for us. As a consultancy, um, we are not only plugging into uh, projects that involve uh, public administration much more than we've seen uh, even in the last five or six years. This has changed immensely. But on the other hand, which uh, I suppose will be picked up uh, by my colleague from Jozef Stefan, um, has also started including more and more the science sector. So obviously the challenges presented by the vast amounts of data that are available and need to be harnessed in order to make these new uh, business models work require some big brains as well. Can I ask a 
more difficult question or straightforward question. From your experience working with a number of companies, can you do a little bit of digital transformation? Basically, operationally improving this and that, or do you think that companies which want to have a great future have to make a major shift, not only technically, but also organizationally, strategically? Can you be a little bit digital? No, you can't. I mean, uh, but I'll also uh, tell you why. Because I think that um, why you can be a little bit digital is because. Uh, Again, as said before, I think that it requires a uh, vision, not a great, uh, grandiose, brilliant vision, but it requires um, the, uh, someone with uh, a clear way forward. And then I think that the small steps are just the way of getting there. So you need small steps to get there, but it's not an incremental process. It's a process that starts with a vision that is not somewhere uh, in the distant future. It's something that is around the corner and needs to start now. There's a bit of a contradiction here. Sorry, I'm drilling in. Go on. Step by step, but it's incremental. No, no, it's not incremental. That's what it's, I said. It's, it's Sorry, then I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. It's, Somebody has used the term, uh, this is reshuffling the cards. Reshuffling the cards can be interpreted in different ways. Either I do this to be better in playing the cards, or I play a very different game. It's playing a, a very different game. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So we, there's a, another client that I like to use when talking about these things. It's retail, you know, a very, very dull business uh, in its essence. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that because it's become so disruptive with uh, people in, in introducing new models which are heavily based on analytics really, um, the incumbents were faced with uh, a really tough choice. So either play your own model and play it the way you used to play it and just use um, incremental steps uh, derived from what you can gather in terms of uh, data, which actually enable them to do one of the two things. So either lose ground, lose market share, or lose profitability. You can do both. Uh, the only way you can do both is to uh, radically change the way you do business and the way you look at yourself. So I think that the answer there is, is clear. Thank you. Mr. Jamal, you are representing the academic side here. You come from Ljubljana, you have a master in science, you have stayed in the field, and you have a great interest through your UNESCO chair of open technologies in education. Now, when you listen to this, is the educational sector transforming itself digitally. And I'm thinking about schools, colleges, universities, and perhaps we leave out research institutes for a moment, <laughs> which you had, I know, right? Has the digital world arrived in the classroom? Um, yeah, so sadly not yet. Um, the problem is that um, when you look at um, all the society subsystems, and the most rigid one is education, and which, which actually is the substantial one if you want to change heads, so if you want to change minds, if you want to do something on long term, then you have to start from the ground. So, and the problem here is that we have a real clash of generations because what we, all the people do for our kids is that we try to somehow reflect our past or their future. And if you want to change anything today in a regular um, educational system, you will need five years. So five years to change a curricula would mean that whatever we start to think about is necessary today, it gets old already in one year and it gets you know, passed in five years. So this is why the, the, the way to do, to get through it is actually to try to build something which is complementary. And this is this open education idea. So the open education movement, which spans from various different places. There are many things you can get into. You can find a lot of stuff around. And actually, this brings in some, some, um, some flexibility into this rigidness. And apparently, 
trying to create something which is a system which, which has few rules and a lot of freedom. So you can very easily imagine yourself as a, so we are working also with, uh, with kids in kindergartens, we are talking with kids in kindergartens, in primary schools, secondary schools, in lifelong learning, in third generation. And um, so you can easily find that um, the kids are very, and you know that, your parents, uh, they're very open, they're different. And they came to school and they have a completely different perception of what they expect from the school. And with this perception, and on the other side with the rigid system, you get the clash. So they're getting nervous, teachers are getting nervous, the system is getting nervous, parents are getting nervous. We're all nervous because we created a system which is not flexible enough. And um, so, and this is one, just one level because, you know, at the end of the day, so I'm, all, I'm also doing research on AI, so artificial intelligence, big data, whatever you spoke today, we, we are deep in. So smart grids, smart cities, autonomous cars, uh, media, and all this stuff. So we know that what the AI can do today already. So understanding content, which is even visual, so videos and all this stuff. On the other side, understanding persons, understanding individuals, not just about the background knowledge, about also the aspirations, about the way how they learn and everything else. So personalization, just to match those two things together. So just imagine, that, you know, this, this grandma's ethic idea. So you come, you open as a kid, and you say, wow, there's a lot of things I can do. Just imagine that we will, instead of having something which is a tailored, tailored style education, so tailorism style of education, when you push everybody to, to the mechanism, you will have the wow effect, the grandma's ethic style of education, when you would say to kids, look, here's a playground. Play with it. Play with the science. Play with the content. Try to get, try to make your dreams come true. And this is what open education is all about. This is what we're trying to do. And so, we have been quite successful, actually. Slovenia, as a reference country, is a Slovenia as a reference country in open education because we are doing that as the only, the first country in the world. We are doing that holistically and systemically through concrete projects, through complete vertical, and from formal and informal education. Can I just interrupt? This is only applicable to kindergartens or no, no, primary no, no, schools, no. secondary schools, but also to universities. It's, it's about your life. It's not, you are not learning only in kindergartens, right? You're learning through all your life. So it, the idea is that you don't cut the system as we do today. It's, you know, you get into kindergartens and you come out and then we cut the system. We, we say, okay, we forget about what was there for everybody in kindergartens. We start from the scratch. And then we do the same after the primary school and the secondary school and university, and we are actually cutting the, the, the live stream of an individual. Okay, so this is something new coming out of Slovenia. Exactly. And if I understood you correctly, because the traditional educational system, which, by the way, still certifies you that you have to be at school and you, you get your diploma from the university, they have a monopoly. We do this because these institutions are not prepared to change. Did you say that? It's very hard. So we, we started um, because we, it was actually a by-side effect. So since we, we do research on AI and big data, we, went, we wanted to get hands-on videos. So we started to, to, to record you know, ourselves and lectures at the Institute in 2002. <coughs> and we made an open. You know what was the first? The first reply from the famous professors we recorded. The first reply was, this is my content. I don't allow you to put it yeah. around. So that was the first reply. The second reply, after we came across to that, so that was, OK, so you're recording me. And my rector and my director will see what I'm talking about. So you please don't put that online. So it is a growing process. So it's better at the universities because at least they're more open, they're more competitive. But it's worse when you go down to secondary school and primary school, which are more bounded to national curricula. And you know, the fact is also that if you look at it, so it's, it's not just about opening education and opening heads. It's also about opening institutions and the system and changing the roles of the teacher because today, 
the teacher role is not the teacher anymore, and the, the role of the school is not a school anymore. It's something completely different. Yeah, let's just stop. We had uh, yeah, we had uh, Dr. Menon uh, mentioning Korean families now contacting uh, U.S. Korean educators in the United States to get the education here. Um, he also talked about you know what can be done for cities in Bangladesh, etc. Do you need universities in Slovenia when you get better teachers, perhaps not giving lectures where everybody falls asleep? And I'm saying this because I'm an educator myself, <laughs> right? But would rather prefer to play on their mobile while sitting in a large amphitheater. Do we need universities? Oh yeah, you need, you need wisdom. You know, you don't get wisdom online. You don't get guidance online. You only get guidance from a good professor. So the role, the, the changing the role of a professor is not anymore to have a lecture um, before the audience. It's about guiding. It's about inspiring me and opening the doors. Because the kids, you know, the students are knocking on your door, and you are having all this huge network of connections, like people here sitting here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what would be your role? You know, opening the door. You, what they want to do? You know, I want to work with Cisco guy. Yeah. I'm opening the door, I'm connecting with you, so just go, just go ahead, just go further okay, on. Okay, but that, that implies somehow a closer relationship between a professor and educator and the students. You cannot do that in a big amphitheater. You cannot have a personal relationship with 300 people sitting in front of you uh, and yeah. thinking about something very different from yeah. what you're doing. In fact, the word lecture comes from the time when the professor was the only one in the room who could read. That's about 500 years ago, right? One has to think about the traditional universities or educational institutions. How do you revolutionize that? So a very interesting experiment were MOOCs. Mm -hmm. Experiment because you had this you know, idea, a rock and roll concert, concert. so you know, one, one teacher and 100,000 students, so how can you manage, what will happen out of it? The fact was that what, was the most, what is the most appealing uh, um, motivation for students to join, not really about the professor, but about the community. Yeah. So you get together, not because, as this is what I'm saying, rock and roll concert, because you go to the rock and roll concert to, to listen to the guy, but you know, you can imagine yourself being at Rolling Stones alone, and the guys are playing that, so would you enjoy the concert? Not really. Or going to a football game, sitting there alone, and all the other players are playing just for you? You will certainly not enjoy that. It's about, it's about um, feeling that you are part of the something bigger whole. Mm -hmm. And these MOOCs are actually showing that the, the, the communities that are just below the, the, the topic and the professor is just a motivator so that this community will start to grow up and create their own ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we see something coming up. The MOOCs, uh, where you have one million students following a certain course, which are increasingly also interactive. In the world of academia, to my mind, and I have a biased view, the business schools are most probably ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. One of the business schools of the world is one kilometer away mm -hmm. from here, who is also moving towards seeing the professor not as a lecturer, but as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? That's what you basically mean. Yeah. That's where you get wisdom. And you make use of the wisdom and the knowledge and of the <coughs> ideas which are on stage like we have here. Let me then move, thanks very much, to Mr. Marcy from Microsoft, VP for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. That basically is all the world. Um, uh, no. <laughs> I think no, we have just heard that the rest of the world is just decreasing in size and influence. So uh, you have the growing world. Uh, you have been with Microsoft uh, a long time uh, in various positions uh, and uh, in various countries. Uh, you come originally, I think, from Australia. Yes. A degree from there. You have a degree from UK. Uh, you are now, this is very difficult to see, you're moving so much around. Where are you stationed at this very moment? I'm in Slovenia today. In Slovenia. <laughs> My family's based in Dublin Island. 
Oh, okay, and I still yeah. right. Very good. Now, you are, of course, representing one of the giants in the industry. And uh, it's clear that when we look at the young enterprises or those in the sort of middle size, there is this statement, the winner takes it all. In a sense, for Microsoft, that's history. You have taken it almost all. What room is there, what room do you leave for others to develop their own ideas, to start their businesses, their own standards? Can you even imagine that somebody comes up with a standard which is very different from the Microsoft standard, except it's another company called Google or what have you? Or Apple. <laughs> or Apple, right? Yeah, I think it's fair to say, um, and we've heard uh, this from very different perspectives today, it's a global world. And so when we think about platforms, there are definitely global platforms. If you think about mobile computing, and that's why I made the point, there's absolutely Apple is a leader in, in that platform. But if you take a broader context of computing as a personal experience, not just a device, then of course Google has a very important role, as does Microsoft. If you think about the cloud services that enable those devices, then again, it's companies like Microsoft, another company called Amazon, as well as Google. So there are global scale organizations that do win part of it all. I don't think the winner takes it all in this context, because the most important ingredient is the local software economy, the local ecosystem. To put this into monetary context, um, IDC, the International Data Corporation, demonstrated that for every dollar of revenue that Microsoft makes in a country, in Europe, wherever Euro, the local industry makes about another nine dollars. So there's this amplifier effect. And if I want to put this into the context of the conversation we're having today around digital transformation, there's really three areas that we're seeing significant movement. And you've heard good examples already today in the first area. And that's around how do we better engage with our customers or in the political context with our citizens? How do we move from a transactional engagement to a relationship? How do we turn data and very much open data, Minister, but into actionable insight. And uh, as you say, I'm originally from uh, Sydney, Australia. I haven't been there in a long time. But what the government has done there is really interesting. Um, like many other governments, there are individual discrete call centers, uh, websites, phone numbers for a citizen to engage with government. And it just became terrible, quite frankly. So they actually created a local company called Service New South Wales to have an interagency model, to have one version of the truth for the citizen, a customer 360 degree view. And so if the citizen wanted, wants to engage with a department, they don't call that specific department, they just call this number, or they pick up their mobile device, or they physically go into a location, and the data is there and has that. So that's an excellent example of that. Uh, the second key area that we're very focused on, and we're really seeing trends around uh, the notion of digital transformation, is around how do we make the workers in the private sector, also in the public sector, more productive? Mm. And how do we optimize the operations in support of that? And a very different example I'll give you uh, is the criminal justice system in the UK. Um, now, I've yet to meet a government that says they're increasing their budget. Every government is taking budget away. Clearly, that's, we're seeing that right across the world. At the same time, the case workload in the UK and many other European cities is increasing. And so the judges there had to change how they communicated, how they collaborated, and how they connected. And so a system was actually designed, not by Microsoft. I mean, the platform was built by Microsoft, but the system was designed by a judge. And we worked with this judge, Judge Tanzi, to design the system based on cloud technologies, based on communications collaboration technologies, to help judges communicate and collaborate and get through their workload very, very quickly. Do, can I just interrupt? This is a good example. Would there have been theoretically space for a newcomer to get into that business? 
Well, the new well, was it already because you were there with your PowerPoints and what have you? The platform is, is an enabler. I think we've touched on this already throughout yeah. the day. The platform is not the solution. It's just an enabler. And so uh, the local software economy, that, you know, there's actually a company that built the solution designed by the judge. No, it's not Microsoft. It was a UK-based company. Yeah. And they're now selling that system to the Dutch prosecution service in the Netherlands and are currently moving that service across the world. So there's absolutely space for that. But, but I, I, I want to finish on this point of digital transformation because I think this is critically important. Um, at the end of the day, it's great to engage better with citizens or customers and improve operations. But we're now talking about disruption. We're talking about a very different uh, playing field. And a city that comes to mind um, that has, been, has gone through a rebranding exercise, if that's the best way to describe it, is the city of Barcelona. They're incredible. The mayor, I know him personally, I've met him a number of times. Uh, if you're familiar, they have the Mobile World Congress there. They have the Smart City Expo. So the first thing he did was make sure he attracted these large global events to his city. But it didn't stop there. Again, they're using public cloud technologies provided by Microsoft. Actually, Cisco is another key partner uh, with the city of Barcelona. And what they've done is work with a local Spanish company called BI Smart. And they've taken open data, data from systems, data from structured feeds, data from unstructured feeds, social listening, to really get a sentiment of what's happening in that city, to then enable the government to provide better services. And that's an incredible example of that. So we're really seeing a great example of this. And finishing and coming back to Slovenia, I think the notion of digital transformation, we had this conversation last night, Minister, with the Prime Minister. Slovenia is small enough to be agile, to be nimble, but it's big enough to have impact. And I think therein lies the opportunity for Slovenia, especially in this context of a green reference country in a digital Europe. Thanks very much. Mr. Minister, I apologize that you come as the very last, but the very last is normally the highlight of the panel. Um, you touched upon inclusive Spreading out, inclusively spreading out this digital transformation, which must be a challenge. If we look at society, there's some people who are somewhat not able or left out. I'm thinking here about somebody my age or what have you, uh, who just cannot cope with this dramatic change. How do you make sure that everybody comes along and that the systems which are implemented are also systems which almost everybody can manage. And secondly, and that relates very much to what you just said, how can you make sure that a not too small country, Slovenia, uh, remains included in a global world dominated by the Microsofts and uh, Cisco's of this world? And has an impact on this world and, in a sense, in that area, develops some competitiveness. So two aspects. Internally, how do you take almost everybody along? And secondly, how do you push Slovenia into this global world? Well, how to push Slovenia in the global world is what we're doing today and mm -hmm. every day. We meet Companies, governments cooperate with the Commission, OECD, with different organizations. We are trying to be, as a country, interesting to the rest of the world. So today, if you want to succeed in the uh, changing economy world, in the digital trans transformed world, it's, it's completely irrelevant where you have your headquarters. It's completely irrelevant. So if you want to succeed in that world as a country, it's irrelevant practically where your country sits. But what you have to offer, what kind of a quality of life or models or solution you can share with the world. That's, that's important. And uh, I, I wanted to also reflect before what's uh, connected to your uh, first question. When we talk about the uh, uh, generally uh, as a service provider. You talked about the education system and, and when it comes to different education principle or model or way to deliver knowledge, it's usually a question, aha, this is new model, the old one is gone, so how we will all adapt to new? Mm. This is what I'm trying to always say. It's not that we have one or another. Let's grow new one and then we will see which one will survive. That's organic. 
That's logical. If you have a new way of education and universities will still be the place where students want to meet, okay, they will survive. If there will be in the future a situation that we don't need universities as uh, uh, institutions anymore, okay, we'll cancel them. But if we don't need them, not because, I don't know, government or some project decided so, because people don't need it, because they find the more interesting way. And when we talk about, them, uh, for example, General and other services, the government is one of the biggest service providers. Mm. It's not only that you go uh, to, the, to the clerk uh, that you uh, extend your permit for car or personal car or passport or so on, but we also run the education, the health system, and it's connected to, to hundreds and thousands of services. And I'm very proud that uh, at this moment we have uh, digitally reachable around 270 services you can do completely online. So you, you, can, you can do, I don't know, a permit for your car if it, there is not a physical technical exam, you can prolong permit for your car online. Fine, that's one. But if you want to go to the, to the clerk, to the office, no problem, you go there. Mm. If you want to go online, you do it online. So it's not to close the services. And we always say that we want to have communication with the business and people not in the way how the government is organized, but in the way of life events, which were very common. So my kid goes to school and everything is there, from education, social care, and everything else. That's one approach. And the second approach is that we want to have multi-channel communication with the same topics, with the same content. So if I go online, if I call in the call center, or if I go to the clerk in the office, I will always look, or clerk will always look the same data. Mm. The, maybe interface is different, but definitely, yeah. physically, the data is always the same. Mm. So this is different channels, whatever you like. And that's, that's very important. And then we say, if people like to use some service in that way, they will use it. So if they don't like it, they will not use it. Yeah. And, and our focus is, when we are relating to how we serve the people, is that we reduce the unproductive time. So when you stay in line, it's unproductive time. When you are ill, it's unproductive. When you are social problem, you are unproductive. So you are unproductive and you are cost for yourself and for the country, and your quality of life is lower. So this is what we are focusing, mm. to find the services, the types, and the way to provide them that unproductive time is shortened. I rather play tennis than stay in line. So I do it in the evening online, and I have in the afternoon time to play tennis. That's my productive time, because I like to play tennis. OK. That's very simple philosophy. We are trying to do it through, through uh, all the services. Providing choice. Providing choice and, and, and providing something that people, as, as we say, people like, need, and it improves their lives. So it improves my life. Service is interesting, I need it so, and I have to like it. If I don't like it, if I don't like the, 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 this kind of tablet, I'll, I'll don't use it. Okay, good, very good. Let me just ask quickly for some comments, questions. Yes? It's just, just, I think the room is small enough. Just speak out. Uh, You're a big man. I'm Rajendra Kumar from India, I'm an architect. Uh, my question is a little bit philosophical. I'm, I'm Short. Sure. A short is a sentence with a question mark at the end. I, 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 um, I refer the quote of one of the uh, articles in an uh, 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 online article that Steve Jobs never wanted his kids to use Apple. So I, my question to the panelist is, and specifically to Mr. Mita, that do you think that we are going to, uh, to a digital transformation? And is the human value in danger? I mean, are okay, OK, OK, OK. Let me just take three, three questions. Remember question, sentence with a question mark, right? Three, and then we'll go back to the panel. Anybody? Mine was question mark. Yes. <laughs> yeah? So we are uh, Zainab Patagel, welcome. Uh, so, yeah. um, so you talk here about digital transformation because of uh, disruptors. For Mr. Savage, question, 
what you think in terms of customer experience and relationship is your bigger, biggest disruptor? Uh, Android as a platform or telco provider? Okay. The well, okay. That was a clear question. Technical question. Third question. Comment. Right. Android or telecom, if I understood that correctly? Andro well, Android is a platform that is now, okay, also Apple, iOS, but, but Android is uh, on mobile applications at the moment, I would say, has the majority. So, of course, the, when we uh, prepare mobile applications for our customers, of course, we will take, take into account the reality on the market. Today, it is Android, iOS, who knows what will be tomorrow. But this, are, as it was said before, and I agree completely, only platforms. But we are developing our services yeah. that are based on it. And uh, mm. services must be not so much dependent on platforms, but on, on contents. Okay. Uh, on uh, experiences and uh, better interactions or interfaces with the, with the consumers. And this is the main point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I would add, and just to build on that point, I, I don't think platforms disrupt anything but other platforms. So clearly iOS and Android disrupted Windows, let's be clear about that. And there's a change in the ecosystem. But true disruption, and I think in the context that we're talking about, which is disruption in terms of citizen services, engagement with customers, business models, that's more the, the apps, the services on top of those platforms. I mean, everybody talks about the Uberization effect. Uber is an app that disrupts the taxi industry. Correct. Um, yes, it runs on it runs on Windows. It runs on Android. It runs on iOS. Okay, the second one was rather rhetorical. One question only. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> very short. Very short. Uh, uh, but who will offer these apps? Sorry. Uh, Where do the apps come from? Who is offering them? Will be you or will it be somebody else? Well, this I believe is a field for startups is filled for interactions between institutes, educational institutions, and industry. But this, I don't think, is the issue of uh, utilities to provide. Utilities will uh, try to uh, bring this to the consumer, but they will not be developer. They will be part of it, but not like, like the ones that will create them. OK, your question was fundamentally, as I understood it, are we looking towards a better world? It's a big question, right? Because of the digital transformation, are the human values in pain? Okay. Is it, okay, okay, okay. I can Anybody who wants to take that pretty broad topic? So he was actually asking me, so. <laughs> <laughs> can you be this is yeah, yeah, so I will, I will, a short answer? I will, I, will, I will answer you in a way. Um, um, so the famous mathematician from so last century, Bernard Russell, when they asked him, um, at the, actually at the end of his life, so it was in the 60s, what would, you, what, would you, what would be your message to humanity? And he said, well, I have two messages. One is for the academics, for us, right? And, uh, and the message was, whatever you do, base your work on facts. Okay? So big data. Huh? But the second one was the important one. And the second one was for a social thing, social answer. And he said, in the 60s, the world is getting closer and closer. We are more and more connected. So we need to do, we need to start understand and learning respect and tolerance, which has been there already in the Greek period, He's, has been a little bit there in the Enlightenment period, and then it dies. And now the opportunity is there. We are forced to learn tolerance and respect. And this is something which is fundamentally very important for the humanity to survive. Wow. This is the answer. That is one answer. And I guess there may be many, many more answers to this. This is a very difficult question. Uh, yesterday on the panel, yesterday afternoon, I think it was the uh, president of Serbia who said, uh, uh, I hope I quote her correctly, uh, that uh, people speak uh, but don't listen. So there is a qualification to be made. Okay, any, some other questions? Yes. 
Ah, Albania. Yes, sorry. Yes. OK. Yes. Any question from this side? Comment? Disagreement? Yes, please. Maybe I would just like to relate to what uh, Mr. Kumar um, has said. Um, a little bit of my background and also have uh, one occasional... question. Yes. Um, no CV. Sorry. Yes. Very rude. But okay, very straightforward question. But because I work and live in India in um, a smart education field, that's why. So my one of my concerns these days was: Aren't we facing a new digital divide by making poor students? I'm referring to you know rural India, but. Okay, it can be, of course, um, applied to, to different parts of the world. Aren't we uh, creating new digital devices by equipping uh, poor students with, uh, you know, sophisticated devices, with uh, internet, broadband, whatever, uh, and, um, you know, we, and uh, aren't we creating the world where uh, rich people will have privilege of having a personal tutor? Right, okay. Any other question from this side? Comment? No? Here? No question? All right. Yes, please, Mr. Minister. It's, it's not my field, but everything should be. So, uh, <laughs> ju just a question back to you. Isn't more uh, the, the difference between rich and poor in the classical education, isn't it much higher than on the digital? Because the digital is much easier access to anyone. So this division is much lower and much smaller. And also reflecting to the co complete uh, question about the values. For example, men as a social being, we say we are alienated uh, because we are sitting behind the computers. Yes, but we are communicating with much more people than we did in the past. They said when the telephone was invented that people will, uh, the social values will disappear, come on. We have more connections. So the values have nothing to do with the machines, but we can use the machines or communication tools to reach more people. What I will do of myself and what are my values has nothing to do with the digital revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a broad issue as well. And you're coming from India, you are sort of right in it, while we are not. However, my understanding is whether it's the use of telephones for the farmers in Africa or in education now with the mass education, that these services which can be offered are so much cheaper than everything which was there beforehand, then there's a good chance that this divide, which we otherwise see very clearly, and we had this also on the agenda yesterday afternoon, uh, can at least be avoided to become even the gap wider than uh, eventually even uh, being closed with better, cheaper information technology reaching these people who are far away from the area. Let me ask the panel, were you happy with what you heard? Was there anything you learned? You should ask the audience. No, you know, the, the audience is quiet. I ask you, are, are you at the end of learning? <laughs> right? So was there yeah, anything? I just completed a MOOC myself uh, recently, so yeah? public administration. So. OK, I think anything continue. you picked up out of this discussion? Yes. I think it was very interesting because there is a mixture of uh, various panelists from, from the government, from different parts of industry and academia. And of course, I, I, I estimate also a lot of diplomats in, in audience. So I think this is a good structure to discuss such complex issue as dig digital transformation. And I think the lecture from today's panel is that this is not question of technology. It is here. It is available. It is question of uh, how to apply this technology, what values do we create with that, and what will be the consequences. And this, I think, should we focus on. Mm -hmm. Anything you took out, Giovanni? I think the, the first point is to be willing to change. This, as uh, Primo was mentioning, you need to take this risk and you need this, and this is the paramount uh, prerequisite to do anything in this field. Uh, 
coming uh, towards uh, broader uh, solutions uh, and uh, broader uh, also sources of data. I think whichever business you are in, you cannot remain within your own industry. Mm. You touch uh, uh, the public sector, you touch uh, uh, the academic sector in order to provide better solutions. Uh, just take medical care, just to say it is, you cannot do it on your own on a private, you cannot do it on your own on a public, So, and you cannot do it without uh, the brains of the academy. So whichever sector you want to improve the services, you need to, to go into partnerships where you will definitely need the new frameworks, uh, and sometimes uh, the work between uh, mm -hmm. private and and, uh, and uh, politics uh, is not so easy. That's why I think it's extremely refreshing to see the approach uh, of the Slovenian mm -hmm. government with this open approach uh, to the. Let me ask this is slightly different. And I'm not asking these two gentlemen here. Are you a digital manager? Um, you have to define what is, you what is to define, on your desk? Uh, you have what to is define. at home <laughs> happening? You have to define what's a digital manager. Yes, I think we are managing the digital transformation. And I think, as, as you've seen here today, it is a very, very broad spectrum and it happens in all kinds of things, starting from education, mm -hmm. the government, to uh, the daily life. And I think also on the question here, you see that a lot of people they see something is moving on one side, but on the other side, they're very much concerned about where does it lead to. Because the future, someone said, the future is unpredictable. But yesterday, someone said, the future is unpredictable, but you have to work on it. Yeah. Right? So I think, I'm a digital manager, question mark. We manage the digital transformation. We try to, to grasp the whole thing and move it forward to make smart services, smart moves. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a huge topic. It's a huge topic. You avoided a little bit my question, right? Are you a digital manager? <laughs> yes, I'm um, a digital manager. I'm a bit <laughs> now out of time. This is the analog world. And is the analog world slow? Yes. Yes. OK. Then it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a bit puzzled, right? So yes, thank you. So uh, I would like to thank uh, the audience. The last question I raised, because um, many of us talk about the digital world, this is in your blood. Um, but when it comes to uh, getting home, um, our kids have to help us to do this and that, right? Uh, and not everybody has all the gadgets which we carry around at uh, his or her disposal all the time. So I think that is also um, a challenge for us as individuals. Uh, we have not touched upon the shared economy, which I find fascinating, uh, whether it's Uber or Airbnb or what have you. Um, many of us are now using this. I personally think this is very good to start with this, even if we then decide not to use it or Twitter or what have you. Um, but. Uh, uh, we have to, as I think Mr. Pusser, you said this, we have to really change our mind. A shared economy is quite well done, and we want to do that, we want to share. But if I would ask you now, if you have taken notes, to share them with your neighbor, you would most probably have second thoughts about it. So our mindset of sharing data is not yet there. Perhaps when we listen to the minister, that will come. At least we should, from a government point of view, as I understood you correctly, enable that to do and not to be afraid only to suffer from that. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, contribution. Yes? I would just like to make a, a closing remark that you, that you opened. So what I learned today is that we are destined to cooperate. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. I think it's, it's, it's clear. Deal. This to cooperate. What I learned today is that some are still thinking how to use the technology and the others are thinking how to change because of technology all the models that we have. And this is where we come to the shared economy. A result of the digital transformation is shared economy. Digital transformation or digital technology is a tool. Tool by itself does nothing. What you do with the tool is shared economy. And for me, the base of the next uh, 
industrial revolution is that in the old way we created the production process, the factory, the school, whatever, to produce the result, the service or the product. In the shared economy, digital transformation, we will have a problem and then we will compose what we need to solve it. That's completely different economy and this is where we are going to. Okay. May I just for a second? Very last word. Yes. Uh, so, um, I think that uh, the world has changed from uh, the world of Mike the Mechanic into the world of MacGyvers. So, it's no longer about what you can do with your toolbox, it's where you can find the tools to solve the problem that is ahead of you. And I think that that's the name of the game for everyone in the room here. So, how to do with what you can with everything that's available, not only what's in your bag. So from experience to experiments. Well, uh, uh, educated experiments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me thank you very much, the panelist, the minister for his introduction and also to stay with us here and the audience. Thanks very much.